गुड मॉर्निंग गुड मॉर्निंग so we should go straight to the text without wasting time page 37 the need to realize emptiness Okay. Got it? Without the wisdom realizing the mode of existence, even though you familiarize yourself with the determination to be free and the mind of enlightenment, the root of cyclic existence cannot be cut. Therefore, make an effort to realize dependent arising. got clear right so we are talking about the three principal aspects of the path renunciation bodhicitta and wisdom understanding emptiness so we have done with the two renunciation and bodhicitta now he is saying that you have you have you have studied about renunciation bodhicitta but without the wisdom realizing the mode of existence means without the wisdom that sees things as they are meaning wisdom that sees emptiness without that even though you familiarize yourself with determination to be free renunciation and mind of enlightenment bodhicitta the root of cyclic existence cannot be cut therefore make effort in dependent origination right renunciation is very important the determination to be free is very important it will help you stop many of your clingings and graspings to ephemeral experiences of life that way it is very important there's really the foundation based on which you try to come out from the samsara at at least you develop this aspiration to come out from problems from sufferings And then on top of that if you are bodhicitta the wish to become buddha for the benefit of all sentient be- sentient beings it's really amazing that will destroy many of your self cherishing attitude which is source of many many problems many problems that we experience are thinking just about one self and not about others so it's not to say that you don't think about others or don't think about yourself of course you think about yourself of course you should develop compassion to yourself but <laughs> i thought i thought i'd put it off <laughs> this is cheating me hello He's still saying hello. <laughs> One of my cousins. So, so what we are saying is. what we are saying is not not saying that you should not take care of yourself not to have compassion for yourself not to care about yourself we are not saying that in fact all these practices that we do is for oneself if you want to achieve liberation for yourself enlightenment for yourself but when we talk about not to have self cherishing attitude what we are saying is 
don't develop this self-grasping or self-cherishing attitude where you think just only about yourself and not about others. If I'm able to get the benefit, I don't care what happens to others. That is wrong, stupid. Not only bad for others, it's primarily bad for you. It is now scientifically found that many people who maintain this kind of narrow-mindedness, think about only I, me, and mine, they are prone to all kinds of illnesses, including heart attack. Scientifically, it is found. This is so because your focus becomes very narrow. I, me, and mine. <laughs> I, me, and mine, small circle. And forget about others. When your focus becomes very narrow, right, then you are not able to tolerate any problems and difficulties. Within that small focus, even if you get some small problem, you tend to magnify it, thinking that I am the most miserable person in this world. Everybody is happy, see? Everybody looks happy, they are enjoying. Which is not true, everybody has a problem, but you think like that. It's only me, the miserable fellow, <laughs> suffering, you know? And it's because of this narrow-mindedness, it is now scientifically found that it is because of this narrow-mindedness. It takes more time to heal. And your sickness becomes worse. And this is very important. You need to know this. Very, very important. That's why we are talking so much about the importance of right mental perspective. And I've been given, giving this example in many of my talks. Because unless you understand that, you might think, oh, what this monk is talking about, mental perspective, mental perspective. What we need is money. <laughs> money makes mayor go. That's what we say. And people do think that if I have money, this day especially, many people, they think if you have money, you can do everything. And to a great extent, it looks like that. If you have money, you can now buy everything. Not only buy the the material products, you can buy people and slave them, make them work, whatever, you know. So that way you think, okay, well, all you need is money. And I'm also not saying you don't need money. Everybody needs money, right? But what I'm saying is your main source of long-lasting happiness is not money, not your relatives, and others. It is 100% sure. 100% sure. So mark that point. 100% sure. It is your mind. When your mental attitude, mental outlook is wrong, doesn't matter you are very rich, wealthy. You are living in the most fantastic building with hundreds of servants but still you will not be able to sleep properly on that soft bed when your mind is disturbed. You can't eat food, you can't digest. Right? For example, so this point for me is very important. Otherwise people might think, oh, he's just talking, mental, mental perspective. What do you mean by mental perspective, you know? How can you solve problems by thinking? People think like that. I'm not saying you don't need money, you don't need friends. I'm not saying that. But what we are talking about is the main source of happiness. For example, I give this example normally. Let us say there are two people who are suffering from same migraine headache of same intensity, let us say, two people. So in terms of the, easy, uh, the, the physical illness, they are same, suffering from same mig migraine headache. Right? But because of differences in mental outlook, there will be a difference among these two people. How would they treat that migrant headache? How, would they, how much they are able to tolerate that problem? Things like that. And how, how, how would they be able to use this opportunity for doing good things? There will be a lot of differences. Now, for example, say the first person suffering from migrant headache has a positive attitude. He has a positive attitude, but still has migraine headache. That is true. 
But because of his positive mental attitude, when he gets this terrible migraine headache, but still he does not get discouraged, he starts questioning, saying that why am I having this migraine headache? Is this because of the pollens? Normally it's pollens, you know, or because, as I said, because of lack of sleep, or that you are hungry, or somebody angered you, irritated you, right? So there are many causes. So he will, he will find, try to find out these causes and still try to, try to remain cheerful. He will also go to the hospital, you know, things like that. And then when his friends come to visit him, he still has this headache, but he tries to maintain that cheerfulness and share his problem that I'm having this big migraine headache. It's really terrible, you know, still trying to smile a little bit. Terrible, this big headache I'm having today. Then the friends also, they, they, they'll say, oh, I'm so sorry, you might take rest. Shall we take you to the hospital? Shall we prepare your food? You know? And then if he's a Christian, You might think, okay, it is said that everything is created by the God. So this must have been created by God. So there must be a purpose. So we'll take it. He will welcome it. There must be. In a similar fashion, Buddhists also say, you know, when you get this illness, problems, it's actually a sign of purification. The results of wrong deeds are purified. So become, becoming cleaner. And also the sufferings are kind of challenges where it is giving you an opportunity to see things from a different perspective, a new perspective. You learn a lot when you get problem, not when everything is okay. I, I met people who are doing very, very difficult job. Then I, actually young people are doing very difficult job. So I asked that young person, how, how are you able to deal with it? This is such a difficult job. He said, no, in the beginning, it's all question of habit. In the beginning, it was very difficult. Now it's very easy. <laughs> like that. Right? So, so if that person is a Buddhist, he will say, yeah, my negative karma is purified. But he will not stay there. He'll go to hospital, take rest, whatever is possible he will do. He will also keep the light on keep the doors open, windows open, so that fresh air comes, or from, if he crane his neck from the window, he might see beautiful flowers, that also makes a difference. He will see young small kids playing happily, that also makes a difference. So his illness gets actually, you know, healed quickly, he recovers much quicker, because of this positive attitude. Now the other guy, let us say he has a negative attitude, when he gets this he headache, he will immediately say, of all people, why the hell I'm getting this headache? People say this is God created everything. So this definitely is created by God. God is merciless. He's stupid. Then the Buddhists say, Buddha has compassion. If he has compassion, where is compassion now? When I'm having so much headache. <laughs> when his friends come to his room, smiling, laughing, he'll say, how can you smile in love when I'm dying here with this headache? Get lost. <laughs> so nobody dares to come, right? Then he closes the window, closes the door, switch off the light. All he sees is darkness. Refuses to eat, refuses to go to hospital. Right? So, so what I'm trying to say is your mental perspective, attitude makes huge difference in dealing with difficulties. Because normally we have this tendency to just focus on one thing and get bogged down with that one thing. But the world or your life is not just that one thing. There are so many dimensions. This area I failed, but this area I will succeed. In this subject I failed, that doesn't mean that I fail every time. <laughs> and in fact, there is nothing called failing, it's only learning. So so-called failure is actually the, the stepping stone for success, like that. 
right? So your mental perspective is very, very important. And it is the one thing that is there with you everywhere you go. Your friends may not be there with you. Right now, I don't think you brought all your friends here. I don't think you, you brought all your relatives here. I don't think you, you brought all your bank balance here. Right? But you came with your body and mind. So your mental attitude makes the decision. It tells the body where to go, where not to go. If you have a stupid mind, it will tell you to go to the wrong place, you will get problem. Right? So therefore, uh, the mental perspective is so important. And mental perspective especially means now you should have a mental way of looking things in the way they are. That's what he's saying. You, you may have many other good minds like bodhicitta, renunciation, compassion, loving kindness and so forth. These are very good, very good, very important in your life. They will make a huge difference in your life. But if you want to get a long-lasting happiness, then you need to uproot the, the main obstacle on the path to that long-lasting happiness. The main cause of that long-lasting happiness, sorry, the, the obstacle, the main cause and obstacle for the long-lasting happiness is ignorance. You are not able to develop pure compassion due to ignorance. Harmony, ignorance. Not able to develop bodhicitta due to ignorance. Right? Ignorance of not knowing the reality. And when I say reality, reali reality is of many aspects, many levels. But here we are talking about understanding the ultimate truth, the ultimate reality, which is named as shunyata or emptiness. Right? So, it is only the wisdom that sees the ultimate reality, truth, the emptiness, which can uproot ignorance. Now, ignorance here is not just lack of knowledge. That is also ignorance. But to some extent, that ignorance is forgivable to some extent. Just like ignorance of a small innocent small child. He makes mistakes. The parents realize, yes, it's inno innocent ignorance, right? It is not based on, you know, uh, calculated, reasoned thought, simply more or less innocence. So that is, that is to some extent tolerable, forgivable. So we have two kinds of ignorance. One, just the lack of knowledge. We all have, animals also have. Same ignorance of not knowing things. So therefore, when you don't know ABCD, you have to go to school to remove that ignorance of not knowing and learn ABCD or Kaka Ganga and then gradually you do your you know, college and PhD and things like that. And that helps you remove many of your problems which earlier you faced because of ignorance, lack of knowledge, lack of education, right? Right? So that, that can be done. Now the, 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 main, the root cause of suffering is the, the ignorance which we <coughs> call as the root cause of suffering. That, that ignorance is not just lack of knowledge, but it is a misconception of reality. That is dangerous now. Misconception of reality. When you have misconception of reality, you may be on the wrong side, but still you use reasoning that I'm right. And you come out with some, some reasoning and you will not listen to others. My way is the right way. <laughs> so that is difficult. So therefore, normally, our problem is we are scared of seeing that reality. Because we are not familiar with that ter terrain. We are comfortable with our usual surrounding 
family terrain, you know, just like a pig, quite happy with his pig sty. Pig sty? Okay. Pig sty, pig sty, don't. Pig sty. Okay? Pig sty. There's a Tibetan saying which says, uh, from the perspective of a pig, the pig sty is his uh, palace. Right? So we are familiar, we don't want to go out it, outside, even if there is a lot of problem, you, you, at least you know. So I'm okay with you, I, I know how to handle this one. <laughs> it's okay with me, you know, continue to stay with my husband and wife, although we have, you know, difficulties and quarreling, quarreling almost every day. <laughs> and I'm not exaggerating, I've seen people, husband and wife, who are fighting almost every day, still living together. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? <laughs> right? So that is probably what we call as love-hate relationship. Okay? So, so therefore we need to really come, a little bit come out from our usual self or usual way of seeing things. You need to venture out a little bit. Don't be scared. That's why many of you are very fond of traveling, going for excursion, because you are trying to find out different terrains, how people live in this country, how people live in that country, you know, how the mountains look. I mean, there's a lot of things to learn you can. We do this to some extent, but that is external terrain. But now there are so many undiscovered terrains within our mind, unexplored, uncharted areas in our mind. We need to explore that. Go inside. Don't be afraid. Don't be scared. Go inside. So therefore when we say ignorance, which is the misconception of reality, means what is reality? As I said, there are many facets of reality. Impermanence is reality, right? Impermanence is not invented by Buddha. Suffering, we talk so much about impermanent suffering in Buddhism, but suffering is not invented by Buddha. <laughs> Even before Buddha, there was suffering, <laughs> right? Similarly, emptiness is also not discovered by Buddha. Oh, no, I should not use the word disco, invented by Buddha. So these are all there. These are all there, but he has to highlight this and talk about it because he discovered that although these are various facets of reality, but people are turning a blind eye on these things. People just want to see, people just want to, people just, with, people will just see what they want to see not what they should be seeing. That is the problem. People, people will hear or listen what they want to hear, not what they should be listening, what they should be hearing. So therefore the Buddha is saying, you should see this thing, reality. You should listen to this reality. Not just stay comfortable with your cozy self. Ventured out a little bit. Because he was able to clearly see all these sufferings are, you know, that we are experiencing are kind of unnecessary suffering. There is a remedy for all this, but people don't want to come out and see the causes of the problem. Right? So therefore, he is giving this teaching on four seals, as we call it. So misconception of reality. So now reality, as I said, there are many facets. Impermanence we need to know. Impermanence we need to know. Suffering we need to know. Impermanence we need to know, otherwise we'll, we'll plan to stay here forever, which of course is not possible. Right? You have to move. You have to change, you have to accept that change. But that change, that, that change does not mean that you will lose your identity. The other day we discussed a little bit about the continuity. 
And interestingly, yesterday I was reading a book. The, the very title is Continuity. So I read a little bit of it. And I found that all the philosophical traditions and the science, they all talk about continuity. So that continuity yesterday when I started thinking about it, I thought continuity, probably one way of explaining that continuity is that that continuity itself is not permanent, but still it will continue. For example, if you go by the side of a running river, go by the side of a running river, and then on that running river you throw some flowers, then you can see it's going, the flowers are being carried forth. <laughs> You can see the continuity going and carrying with it the flowers that you put on it. So similarly, our mind travels like that, like that the river, like that stream. So one of the best way of explaining that continuity is that the Buddha gave this example of river. It's impermanent, but continuous. Impermanent? Because the same river will not continue to stay there forever. It just goes, the flow goes. Once the Buddha was, somebody asked, requested Buddha to give a teaching. Then he said, you go to the river and wash yourself and come back, then I'll teach. So he went there, took a bath, came back. Then the Buddha said, no, no, you have to go again. Wash yourself and come back. So he went for a second time, washed himself, came back, and he said, did you wash in the same river or different river? He said, same river. That's what we think. But the Buddha said, no, impossible. <laughs> the river in which you bath is already gone. <laughs> but because of the continuity, we say, we say it is the same river. Right, but this is not that, not that easy to understand because we already our mind is already fixed, you know, uh, grasping onto permanence, you know, something stable, something unchanging. So it's not that easy to understand. Many thinkers and writers, not only you know Buddhist teachers, but Western philosophers have written a lot about continuity, about uh, identity, about the self, you know the false self versus the authentic self. You know, so many write-ups are there. They're very interesting. Should you take time to read some of this? Okay? So, understanding impermanence, therefore, is very, very important. Because impermanence, as I said, said is not just death, but it, it talks about change. Because things are changing, you can become better. If if the the, the 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 river is like not moving at all, if there's no wave in the ocean, probably there will be not much charm to try to surf on the ocean. <laughs> right? <laughs> because it's moving and changing, therefore, you know, you can go with the flow and enjoy. So it's really understanding the continuity means understanding the flow. And you should learn how to go with the flow. That's what we are saying when we talk about impermanence. It's, it's giving us the opportunity, possibilities. If things are static, permanent, there's nothing we can do. You try as hard as you can. Things will remain like more than a rock solid, you know, nothing you can do. Right? <laughs> At the same time, you also need to know, okay, because of this impermanent things are very fragile, I need to take extra care and extra, you know, precaution and things like that. So it, it gives you a beautiful view of how to handle things. Then suffering, as I already said, suffering is introduction to happiness. Suffering is something like a challenge. If you run away from challenge, difficult jobs, you can never make any improvement. Even when you go to school, mathematics is difficult for many people. But if you say difficult and give up, you will fail. So, so therefore, Shanti Deva, in the book that I distributed, it says, if you make your mind habituated with something, there is nothing that will not become easier. 
And he gave a very beautiful example. The beautiful example that he gave is, let us imagine, think about a person who is really dreaded by everybody, not only you. Just by hearing the name of that person, you, 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 you uh, tremble. Then <laughs> that person happens to be with the change of time, that person happens to be your next door neighbor. You are terrified. Oh my God, what should I do now? I just can't run away, leaving all my property back. So he has just moved. I don't think he's going to move away very soon. <laughs> so what should I do? Sometimes, you know, not in a such a level, but you're compelled to stay with some people who you don't like. So there also you get some kind of similar kind of experience. So that person continues to there with this new neighbor. <laughs> and you can't just shut your door and get yourself confined in the room 24 hours every day. You also have to go to market, buy things. And when you go out, you see the person also going out, coming, going, things like that. But you make it a point, I will not smile. I will not say hello. And uh, I, I will never show any sign that I am scared of him. So you also with a straight face, you also go. I am also somebody, you know. <laughs> this, if you see some of the animal fighting, you know. Even very small, tiny animals, they also show I am somebody. <laughs> they also fight, you know. <laughs> like that. Squirrels fighting against the snake. Very, my one of my favorite <laughs> thing, and then uh, the uh, what they call it, uh, small animal fighting against tiger and lion things. Anyway, so you do that. So how long you are going to maintain that stature? So that person also did not do anything negative. You have heard about it. He's a terrible person, but he did not personally do anything bad. But you refuse to smile and say hello, things like that. Then after a long time, one day, he also seems to be a little bit bowing his head towards you. So you also a little bit. This is what we do. When we meet people, <laughs> you are not so familiar. Then you greet your mouth or teeth or something like that. <laughs> right, right? <laughs> so you do this. He also does this. Time passes on. Then after a while, you, you, you say, hello. <laughs> that other person also says, hello. Then you start, you know, exchanging few sentences. How are you today, whatever. Then it, this, the conversation becomes longer and longer, and then gradually you become very familiar. And then gradually, not only familiar, you become a very good friend. And you start loving each other now. So much so, that now you feel unhappy in the absence of that person. The person whose very name <laughs> you used to tremble earlier. So, so that's the point. There's nothing that will not become easy if you get habituated with things. And I'm sure all of you have this experience. I have this experience also. Some people for the first time when you see it, this person looks really, really like not a good person, you know. You get what you call as the so-called bad vibration, huh? <laughs> so it looks like a, he's really a bully or something like that, you know. But then gradually learn this person of the physically very big and terrifying, but when you really become friendly, he's such a nice person. And then there are others who on the very first day looks very nice, smiling, inviting, so good. But gradually, when you make more connection with this person, he turns out to be the, the, the real ugly person, <laughs> right? So you can't <laughs> decide things on the spot. So my main point is, in terms of your practice, never say, I can't do this. You start doing few things, and then you will say, oh, this is not, not difficult, it's very easy. So habituation, practice, practice, that's important.
So suffering also like that. When you write from the beginning, it says there's suffering, and then you get overwhelmed. You know. But you look closely. And especially when you encounter some problem, some difficulty, then it is important to maintain the tranquility of your mind. Then you will be in a much better position to deal with this problem. So right from the beginning, if you get scared and uh, run away from those problems, you will not be able to face it. Right? So how would you face a problem? It depends. Sometimes it, it is important to closely look at the problem, study it, and it will vanish. Sometimes you need to avoid that problem. Sometimes you need to run away from this problem. Just like you are being, you know, uh, like, like for example, the fear that you get in the aeroplane when you, you know, fly in a turbulent zone. You get fear, right? So what should you do now? You hold tightly on the don't, don't, don't. We, we, are, we do this. You hold tightly to the chair. It doesn't help. <laughs> <laughs> so what should you do? Do some prayer, maybe a little bit. But, but, but it's, it, it, it's important to maintain the calmness of the mind. Listen to a music or uh, make sure you have your belt tied. <laughs> that, that is the most important thing you can do. Otherwise, don't, don't get scared because that is not the solution. You do some prayer, listen to a music, or do some breathing meditation. It really helps. Right? So there's nothing much you can do. But if you are chased by a mad dog, then the best thing is run away. <laughs> right? There's no possibility to run away, then maybe you have to use a stick or something like that. So it depends on different situation. Different situation. So anyway, sufferings or ups and downs in life, this is a common phenomenon that we experience all the time. So it is important to maintain that mental balance. Okay? So now this topic on emptiness, misconception of reality. Ignorance is misconception of reality. Here, ignorance, which is said to be the root cause of samsara, is not just a lack of knowledge, but a misconception of reality. Now, when we say misconception of reality, the reality is that there is a nothing that has inherent independent existence. That is the reality, including emptiness. Any phenomena, permanent, impermanent phenomena, there is nothing that is inherent existence. Meaning that in the level of conditioned phenomena, impermanent phenomena, they don't have independent existence because they are product of their causes and conditions. Like we are product of our causes and conditions. Right? So we don't have independent inherent existence. Then, in the case of the other, the rest of the phenomena, or whole phenomena, they are just designated by our mind. If they have an independent inherent existence, then it, it should not be dependent on the, the term, the designation. It is dependent on the designation. We call emptiness emptiness. That word emptiness is also designation. Right? So it is dependent on names and terms. Now this is important. Names and terms that we designate looks insignificant, but we hold so much on to the names and terms. Right? So therefore, we, we, we are compelled to say, yes, we have to give names and terms, but the reality is they have only a nominal existence. Nominal existence. Nominal existence means apart from this name, if you try to pinpoint and find out that object, you will never be able to find it. Something called identity, something called person, you, won't, you will never be able to find it. Right? For example, Gishi, Gishi Lagdor is sitting in front of you right now, right? Do you see Gishi Lagdor? Do you see Gishi Lagdor? No, you can't see Gishi Lagdor. Gishi Lagdor is not this body. What you are seeing is my body. 
my body is not me, right? My body is not me. My mind is not me. My body, my mind belong to me. I am the owner. They are what I owned. So the possession and the, the possessor, they are different. Right? So where is Geshe Lakdor? Apart from this body and mind, where is it? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> she is really in a attacking mood. <laughs> wow! <laughs> how? How? <laughs> so hold it, hold it for a short time. <laughs> okay. So, the point I'm saying is, my, it's 100% sure. You can find that out. My body is not me, 100% sure. Are you your hand? Are you your hand? Nobody will say, I'm, I'm my hand. Nobody will say, I'm my head. So similarly, I'm not my body. So similarly, I'm not my mind. So apart from the body and mind, where is this thing called I? Or Geshe Lagdor? Or Mary, or whatever is your name. So where is it? It's just designated. Now, now when you think about that, if you understand a little bit of it, you might get flabbergasted. This is, this is the, the difficult area. Things exist, but they don't exist as we think. Right? Right? So your hand, your head, your leg, and anything, like for example, this, this eyeglass. This is eyeglass, right? And then I have the, the microphone or something here, you know, or here. So if I say, now I will wear my microphone, and I will now speak through my eyeglass. You will immediately think Geshe Lagdola this morning is now <laughs> out of mind. <laughs> right? Why can't I call this eyeglass and why I can't call this microphone? Why? Why I can't call this microphone? This is just a designation. Somebody give this designation name eyeglass and we have no problem with it. So, okay, eyeglass. Because the purpose of giving a name is that we need to communicate to each other. With our name, how can you how are you going to communicate? So then we give name, Joseph, you know, Frederick, you know, whatever. Give different names. Only for communication. But not being satisfied with this name and term, if you really try to point something, you know, you tear my body apart, you know. And uh, then, then try to find the real Geshe Lagdor inside and take out. You, you can't find anything like that. This is magic and mystery. And if you understand it, that will help you not to develop too much grasping. Earlier you used to think, especially when you get angry, how dare you say these things to me? <laughs> Geshe Lagdor, existing from its own side, ready to fight. We used to think like that, right? In our ordinary trance, in ordinary life. But now with this understanding, <laughs> where is this Geshe Lakdor? <laughs> Just a designation. Why you are so carried away? By, why you are so attached, obsessed with this designation? The other day I said, if somebody calls you Buddha, you will not become Buddha. Right? Somebody calls you dog, you don't have to bark. <laughs> I've said these things, right? So that makes a huge difference. But it's not, not easy to understand. When somebody asked Buddha to give an example of emptiness, he said it is like the space. Example he gave us space. Now look at space. Space gives you this opportunity 
Space gives opportunity for everything to come into existence. If there is no space, how are you going to get it? this existence? Right? Space. And space means also does not obstruct. So, it, so therefore, if you understand this space like emptiness, all these sufferings, obstructions that we encounter in our life will crumble, go away. Right? We have all seen birds flying to and fro, peacocks, crows, hawks, eagles, right? In the space. Everybody is flying. Aeroplanes also now. But have you seen any birds building nest in the space? Have you seen? In the space. Because they know this is space. There's no point to develop attachment to the space. <laughs> I can't, they know I can't build a house here in the space. No, gradually, maybe, I don't know. With great scientific development, maybe. So similar, similar like that. Right? So therefore, in this text, he says, without this wisdom understanding the way things are, even if you have bodhicitta, even if you have renunciation, you will not be able to cut the root of suffering. Therefore, you should understand emptiness. He did not say. Instead, he said, therefore, you should understand dependent origination. Mark this point. This is very important. Therefore, make an effort to realize dependent arising. Whereas, actually, he should have said, therefore, make an effort to realize emptiness. He did not say that. This is very important. This is very important because your target is, of course, to develop this wisdom, understanding, emptiness, which is really the antidote to remove ignorance. But you cannot understand emptiness without understanding dependent origination. This is very important. So therefore, there are teachings which say the, dependent, the concept of dependent origination and emptiness should be seen, treated equally, respected equally, and you should actually pay more attention on the dependent origination than on emptiness. Because if you just right away start on emptiness, you might fall into nihilism. For our untrained mind, it's, it's not easy. Because we, we like concrete people. The real people sitting there talking. If you say he doesn't have that independent inherent existence, Then, then how can I love this person? You need concrete, something concrete. I told you this, this young boy from Russia asked me this question, you know. If things are impermanent, then how can I love my, my girlfriend? Did I tell you this earlier? Yes, I told you. So similarly, if you might think that if things don't have independent existence, how can I love my boyfriend or girlfriend? Because you need your boyfriend, girlfriend, and every other is something concrete that you can touch, that you can hug, you know, that you can feel, <laughs> right? And that, that will be there permanently. But what this teaching is saying is, yes, things have nominal dependent origination. When we talk about emptiness, we are not saying they are not there. They are there, so you can still hug. You can still shake hand, but in a different way now. with an understanding that this person doesn't have permanent existence, inherent existence. Therefore, this person is fragile. I need to treat this person with more care, with more love than before. If this person has permanent, independent existence, you try to be rude and exploit this person as, as much as possible. That will not make an inch of difference to this person, because that person is permanent. Existing from its own side. <laughs> right? Right? So therefore, we should endeavor to cut the root of the cycle of existence, which is ignorance. Ignorance means misconception of reality. Reality is that everything is interconnected, interdependent, designated, but to our ordinary mind, we think the other way. We think things have independent existence. 
Therefore, we get stuck there. Right? For example, if you, if you like somebody, if you love somebody, at that time you will not only think this person as handsome, beautiful or attractive, but you will think this person is 100% attractive and beautiful. This beauty, handsomeness of this person is there from its own sight, permanent. Wow, so good. You know, that's why we are easily duped by many of these shows on television. There are so many shows these days. People make some kind of magic and then hundreds and hundreds of people are watching there with wide open mouth. Wow, and some people are even crying, you know. Right? America has got talent. Do you watch that? <laughs> and also India has talent. So many shows are there, you know. Some of these are really, I don't know how they do it. This magical, they create all this kind of thing. But still it's an illusion. And because we don't know these subjects like emptiness, where everything can be created, you are mesmerized by that illusion. Wow. Right? So, when the right causes and conditions are put together, you can, you can do all miracles. Therefore, the Buddha said, the power of substance is unthinkable. The power of mantra is unthinkable. Power of karma is unthinkable. Power of meditation is unthinkable. The power is there, but we, we have to use that power properly. Right? Now power of substance is unthinkable. We are all seeing it, you know. I'm talking here and this is being watched in not only here but many other areas. Science is able to at least transmit the, the body and the sound, not the other sense, you know, uh, test they can't transmit. The real touch they can't transmit. Right? The real smell you they can't transmit. Only only the body and the sound. So at least they've achieved so much. So misconception of reality. Therefore make effort in understanding interdependent origination. So this means now interdependent origination and emptiness, they are two this should be considered as two sides of the same coin. When we say emptiness, we are not saying things don't exist. Things exist, but they don't exist independently. Those of you who have attended my talks earlier, this should be completely clear. I, I repeat this all the time. Right? So emptiness means not nothingness, but emptiness means empty of independent existence. This is important because things exist. Now when things exist, there are only two ways of existence. Either they should exist dependently or they should exist independently. Dependent existence, independent existence, they are mutually exclusive. They are, there is no third possibility. Has to be one of them. Huh? Emptiness means not nothingness. Emptiness means empty of independent existence. So in order to elucidate that point, I said, when things exist, there are only two ways of existence. Independent existence or dependent existence. It has to be one of them. There is no third possibility. They are mutually exclusive. So now, which one is right? Dependent existence or independent existence? You bring any phenomena. Dependent existence or independent existence? Huh? Huh? Dependent existence. Because of dependent existence, there is no independent existence. They are mutually exclusive, as I said. So, emptiness means empty of Independent existence. 
Huh? Yeah. Yeah. No, even even space is a designation. Just like emptiness. It's dependent on the designation. Right? Okay. So wait, hold, hold. <laughs> if you ask question a little bit later, there's more charm. <laughs> more more attraction. Because you're dying to ask that question. I've been holding on to this for the last ten, twenty minutes, you know. Then you, you can blast out your question, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Bombard with your questions. <laughs> right. So so make this point clear. Things exist dependently, therefore there is no independent existence. So emptiness means empty of say it loudly. Emptiness means empty of this one you need to know. <laughs> this one you need to take back to your country. <laughs> Otherwise you will hear this again and again. Then we have this tendency to say, Tibetan teachers also say that, students also say that, when it comes to the trouble of emptiness, then they say, oh, emptiness is not easy. It is so difficult. The teachers also say like that. Students also think, wow, this emptiness thing is so difficult. My, my dear friend, it is not so difficult. Realizing it, realizing it directly, experientially, is really difficult. But you get some idea, it's not so difficult. As I said, you already now know what it's emptiness. Emptiness means? See, here you go. You already know it. Emptiness is like cipher, zero, in mathematics. In mathematics, zero doesn't mean no value. Without zero, you can't have 10, 100, and so forth. Right? So emptiness also does not mean nothingness. Emptiness is really like the space, as I said, providing that background and space for you to do so many things. It's the playground. It's the stage on which you can perform so many things. Therefore, Nagarjuna, the, the one of the most famous teachers who taught extensively on emptiness, he said, if emptiness is possible, everything is possible. If emptiness is not possible, nothing is possible. And both this philosophical concept of emptiness, mathematical concept of zero, invented in India. Other countries, experts have played in it, but India played a huge role in bringing out this concept of philosophical concept of emptiness and mathematical concept of zero. Right? Right? So therefore, now because things are dependent on each other for the causes and conditions, the designation, therefore there is nothing that is independent existence, that is, therefore emptiness, empty of independent existence. Now when you understand that state of emptiness, then there is not much room for de to, room to develop excessive obsession to some and obsession, you know, uh, excessive hatred to others. Ordinarily, as I was explaining, that when you like somebody, when you fancy somebody, you tend to think this person is 100% good, 100% beautiful, 100% handsome. That person may be handsome, but not necessarily 100%, not perfect. When you dislike somebody, then, like your enemy, then you say, this enemy is 100% negative. This is the problem we are having right now in the world or among people. This person is 100% negative. He is really the embodiment of everything that is bad. Evil, ghost. How can I talk to this person? How can I have negotiation? How can I have dialogue? But if you calm down a little bit and think that person may be bad, may be negative, may, be, may have done many bad things, but still that person has many good qualities also. This person is the, the leader of the world, the leader of that particular country. 
So there may be many people who are seeing many good things in, in him and in, indeed there may be good things also. So still there should be room for dialogue negotiation. Right? So there, therefore, you, you, the, the purpose of understanding this emptiness is that you lessen the intensity of development of negative emotions. That is the purpose. It's not only understanding the way things are. The purpose is to again destroy the arisal of negative emotions. Right? So the best way of understanding shunyata is through understanding dependent origination. Okay, now you ask questions. <laughs> now you can bombard me. <laughs> yeah. There is one question on line. Hmm? Where? Your teachings have always, I'm reading an online question by Jitanjali. Huh? That's online. On um, Ajitanjali, are you online? Yeah. Geshela, your teachings have always been invaluable for me. Can I ask a question? Mm. When I see animals around the world tortured in immense physical pain, I become depressed and lose my mental balance. Please, can you help me understand how this suffering of mine may be leading to my purification? This will really help me come out of this sadness and do something actively for the helpless animals. Yeah, it is said to have said that the Buddha is said to have said to his uh, uh, helper Ananda, and he said, when sentient beings are afflicted by suffering, Ananda don't lament. <laughs> the Buddha is said to have said to Ananda, his helper, Ananda, when you see suffering of sentient beings, don't lament. I, 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 I can interpret this by saying that if your, your showing concern is amazing, wonderful, that, is, that must be there. But your being completely overpowered by sadness and helplessness, that will not even help you help the animals. Because if you want to help, as I said the other day, if you want to help others, and including helping animals, if you help, want to help others, first help yourself. First help yourself. I have few friends who really in Bombay, I used to have one uh, f friend or follow whatever, uh, uh, a young girl. She, she, she's always carrying a big bag with all the medicines, foods, whatever, to look after the stray dogs. And very often she would come home with bruises all over her head, you know, dog bite and things like that. <laughs> so, therefore, <laughs> You know, therefore, it is important that you help the dog or the animals, but make sure that <laughs> you don't suffer from dog bite. You protect yourself. That's important. Because if you don't protect yourself, if you feel very, very sad and uh, develop helplessness, because it is possible to develop this sense of helplessness, because the sufferings of sentient beings are too much. Sufferings of animals, too much. So many, you can't solve it. You have an Avalokiteshvara statue here. If you look at this the, the statue or picture of Avalokiteshvara, it has 11 heads. 11 heads. The story goes like this. Avalokiteshvara, of course, is embodiment of compassion, has a lot of compassion. So every time he is trying to help many people, many sentient beings, deliver them from their state of suffering to state of peace and happiness one day. Next day he goes, he finds the same amount of people or sentient beings. Then he helps them. The next day he will find the same amount of people, sometimes even more. So he did this repeatedly for some time. Then he said, I give up. 
First you made a promise that I'll deliver all the suffering sentient beings to peace and happiness and things like that. But because that is the situation, he, he said, I will give up. I can't do this anymore. Because he broke his promise, it is said his head split into 11 parts. So now you see this statue that Avalokiteshvara has 11 heads. That is the story. Right? So at that time, the Buddha, I mean, uh, Taba, I think I'm a Taba, I'm a Taba, I always confuse these two things. Anyway, the Buddha, whoever, <laughs> Ami, Amitabha, I think. Amitabha came and said, my son, don't get discouraged. Continue to, you, continue to do your work. I will always be there with you. So on top of this 11 head, there is the head of the Buddha Amitabha. That's the story, right? So, 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 so we can't, just one person can't solve all the problems. Forget about you know, solving the problems of all the animals. You know, you can't even solve the problems of one city. Just one person can't. But that doesn't mean you, you, are, you, are, you are useless. Every day you are helping somebody. That is great. That is really great. Right? So then helping the animals or whoever is not just giving food and things like that. There may be many other ways, better ways of helping it. So think about all those things. Okay, there's no need to get discouraged. Okay, thank you, Gitanjali Ji. I see the name, yeah, yeah. question here and there's this question hello yeah I, okay I'm very nervous yeah. <laughs> <Whew>. um, <laughs> that's why I told you to hold it <laughs> <laughs> yes, 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 yes. so my question like I studied uh, Nagarjuna in Buddhist philosophy very good and I really like it and my question is when, like what you said, when dependent existence ex excludes independence, but I cannot negotiate anything without being, uh, without it being existent. Um, where is the middle way between independence and dependence? So, for example, <sighs> when there would be no human being wouldn't at least something beyond designations exist? So emptiness pointing to experience beyond designation and the emptiness of emptiness pointing to the simultaneous existence of the both realms of existence. Yeah, there is no middle way between dependent existence and independent existence. Because as I said, these are mutually exclusive. The example that is given in the text is this is like the, the, the owl and the crow. <laughs> owl and crow are said to be sworn enemies. <laughs> they, they, they can't be together. So there's no middle way between dependent existence and independent existence, right? So because things are dependent, therefore they, we say they are dependent on their causes and conditions and names and designations without using these labels and names there's no way you can pinpoint to anybody. But in terms of your own experience, when you realize and experience, you know, if, you're, if somebody asks somebody who has really, you know, realized emptiness, how was your experience? Can you share? Then he says, Masam Jimmy Shira, for it is unspeakable, inexpressible. That is the nature of wisdom perfection. Just like a dumb person experiencing sugar. And when a dumb person experiences sugar, he's experiencing the sweetness. But he'll not be able to talk about it. He's dumb. So, so similarly, the exact experience of shunyata, it is said, very difficult to share it. If you want to know, you have to personally experience it. So that, that is the... That is the answer. Okay. Yeah. 
Okay. Um, thank you for your precious teachings. I'm here. <laughs> okay, yeah. So, I have two questions. Mm. My first question is, in Christianity, there is a concept, love other people the way you love yourself. Mm. In Buddhism, if I understood correctly, we should first love others and dedicate our life to the well-being of others mm. to free them from suffering. Mm. Does Buddhism recommend to practice self-love? And if yes, where do you draw the line between self-love and egoism? Self-love and? Ego or Ego. egoism. Oh, no, no. Yeah, yeah. Many people misunderstand that. Loving oneself does not mean that you should develop this self-cherishing attitude. So that's why we were you know, discussing that you should not have self-cherishing attitude. And I already explained it. Don't develop self-cherishing attitude, but take good care of yourself, meaning that you love yourself. Right? And especially in the Mahayana practice, if you are somebody who is supposed to be loving others, then you should love yourself all the more. Because now you belong to others. You are for others. You are the property of other people. <laughs> so if you don't take care of yourself, it means you are not taking care of the, the wealth of other people. Right? So, so I, I, the other day I also give you the example of why people make long life offering to His Holiness. And His Holiness also, also saying, yes, I will live 110 years and I am taking good care of my health because He cares other people. The more you care about other people, the more you love yourself, but not in the selfish way. But but with wisdom. With wisdom. Right? Okay? Thank you. Yeah. And uh, my second question is, which spiritual practices besides meditation would you recommend to do in order to develop love, compassion, and equanimity towards people whose actions are immoral animalistic and who put their own interests higher than interests of others. Yeah. Here I'm also referring to people who find their happiness in others' pain and suffering. For example, the Tibetan monk who was able to stay compassionate towards Chinese, although he was tortured by them. Mm. How is it possible to realize in this situation that your real enemy is within you? Yeah, so, so as, I, as I was saying, as the monk also said, that, and as we say in Buddhism, had the sin, not the sinner. Had the sin, not the sinner. Right? To the sinner, you should develop even more compassion. Because this person is now thinking only about oneself and even enjoys when others are suffering because of ignorance. When you are crazy, when you are ignorant, you, when your mind is not functioning, you end up doing so many stupid things. For example, after the teaching, if you move to Meglor in the in the marketplace, if you see a mad person shouting and saying all the nasty things, you will understand it. You will understand that this person is not doing this because he is sane and his mind is functioning. You, you know that this person is saying all these things, doing all these nasty things, because this person is now out of mind. Therefore, you will not get angry. You will instead feel sorry for this person. Develop some compassion. So similarly, I mean, not only this dramatic examples, but even in all of us, we all have these problems and difficulties, doing bad things. You know, all of us have this problem because of presence of negative emotion. When the, the, there is a strong presence of negative emotion, then not only we you know, kill other people, we also commit suicide. Based on the so-called self-love, which is not pure love, and you are supposed to be looking after yourself, you are not able to do that, and then and in a desperate attempt, you, you commit yourself, you know, suicide. So therefore, uh, again, this is from Shanti Devas, Bodhicharayavatara, where he says, <laughs> So f when you see such people, even if you are unable to develop compassion, to get angry is a 
difficult to understand. Even if you don't develop compassion, when people do all these things out of madness, and you also join in that group of madness and hating each other, <laughs> then they say, then what is this? What are you doing? <laughs> right? I mean, again, of course, this, I'm not saying this is not easy. That's why many people think, you know, many people think, you know, these people will never listen to us. So the only thing, only language they understand is gun. The only language they understand is ballistic missile. There are people who say things. And I, I, I can't blame them because the situation is such sometimes, and then they are ordinary people. They have anger, jealousy, hatred, everything they have. Right? And then the other person also, like, like, okay, now I should be very careful not to go into politics. <laughs> <laughs> right? So it's, this is happening everywhere, you see. So, so therefore what we need to do is, in order to confront the wrongdoing or the so-called enemy, the best tactic is, first you should empower yourself. Empower your younger generation. Give them good education. Make them reach on the international platform to talk about Tibet or whatever. You know? Even animals. I've seen like deers. They butt each other and fight. And then one loses. Then he goes to an isolated place and in an empty place that deer trains how to butt properly. Then come back and fight and win. I've, even with animals, I've seen such things, you see. So in our case also, you know, we need to really, if you, if you really want to, you know, uh, protect, protect your community, your, you know, nation, or the world as a whole, we need to educate people. Give the right education so that your country is peaceful. And then gradually the whole world is peaceful. And there is no quick solution. Because, I mean, imagine Buddha was here in this world. He could not solve all the problems at his time. Jesus was here. He could not solve all the problems of the mankind. So, who are you, my dear friend? <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not looking down upon you. But I'm, all I'm saying is, we can all make a difference. You carry your responsibility. I can my, carry my responsibility. So through this kind of talks and teachings, I'm, I'm also supposed to be carrying my responsibility to bring more you know, awareness among people. And especially with the younger Tibetan generation, I always think that I should empower them by g giving them the right you know, mental perspective, right education, so that they are able to at least if they are not able to look after the country, at least they are able to look after themselves. That's my top priority. I don't want the young Tibetans, you know, forget about getting country, those things are big things, which we all talk about, but the least thing is that I don't want the younger Tibetan generation begging or suffering due to shortage of food and things like that. Which, right now, I mean, I'm talking about future right now because of His Holiness, the Dalai Lama's great vision, his activities. Even among the Tibetan exiles, there are not many people who are begging, begging. They're relatively okay, you see. Because of good government, good leader, system of ed education. So that is what we need. We need to empower people, empower women, empower men, whoever, you know, we need to empower. Give them the right tool, education, not killing each other. The long run, that is solution. How long are you going to kill? That's why Einstein said, you know, if there is a third world war, then we will all, to a great extent, we will destroy so much. And then after that, if there is a fourth world war, then people will fight with sticks and stones. Because we already destroyed all of the things. Then again, still anger will be there, still imagine. Jealousy will be there because we don't talk about these things. So again, people will fight. <laughs> then at that time, probably no, no atom bomb, no ballistic missile. They have only stones and sticks. 
So therefore, unless, unless we deal with these negative emotions, lessen these negative emotions, if you only highlight I, me, and mine, you know, and continue to harbor this tribal mentality, this religion, my religion is good, this religion is bad, you know, how much we have suffered. So we need to wake up. <laughs> okay. Yes. Yeah. Yes, uh, so Geshe-la, I'm sorry, we have like the many people have asked many questions and there was a policy that they... One question question. each. So please raise your hand if you have... You know, I have this experience, you know, during many gatherings, sometimes we say, okay, now there are many questions, only one question each. Then a clever person will get up and say, yeah, I have one question, but it is too pronged. (laughs) 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 So he's asking two questions, actually, (laughs) two pronged questions. (laughs) <laughs> so no two pronged question, just one question. And because there is the last two sessions, maybe in the next one, uh, uh, we can ask if we can make a line in that side, so the people that want to ask another question, even you ask, have a chance still. Can you speak louder? Sure. <laughs> so because there's only one session left, and there is many questions even by the people. One session, two more also one session. Right. Two so sessions. Can we make a line over there, uh, avoiding the camera, and then everyone who wants to arise a question, you have an opportunity in that side. Um, thank you. So now let's go to this side. Uh, only the people who has not uh, uh, asked any question at all. Thank you. Uh, hello. Um, I would to ask a bit, a bit more about, uh, about suicide. Um, mm. So sort of the psychology of why that happens and of the effects of people around, around that person um, mm. afterwards. It's easy to feel a lot of guilt and questions about what you could have done. Um, and, and, you know, often, yeah, in my experience of someone who has gone that way, they're very... I've experienced a lot of kindness from them, a lot of, you know, our friends, a lot of kindness from them. Um, yeah. So it, it seems like it's, it's, yeah, hard to understand the, you know, I wrote something down. Um, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, I mean, essentially, how, how can we understand that, the psychology that leads to that action? Mm. And um, how do we sort of turn those negative feelings into something useful, something compassionate? Yeah. You heard about Leo Tolstoy, right? Everybody heard about Leo Tolstoy, a very famous Russian writer, very famous. So when he was over 50, reached over 50, his fame was dwindling, as, as happens with life. He was a celebrity, very famous, but over 50, his fame was dwindling. You know, he's not so energetic as before. Then gradually, untraceable, mental illness crept in him. So in the beginning he thought it should be okay, then it becoming more and more, more and more. And he used to go for hunting rabbit. He used to carry a gun and go for hunting rabbit. And then he went into such a strong depression, mental illness. He even thought that now I should not stop, I should stop carrying the gun to hunt the rabbit because instead of shooting at the rabbit, I might shoot myself. 
So at that point of the time, he started asking the question about meaning of human life. It's a long story, beautiful story. So he found many people. Some people, there was one section of people who said, this life really has no meaning, as we all think. No meaning means that one day we will die. So name, fame, money, whatever we accumulated, is all go into the dustbin. So what is the use of this life? Mostly, most of the people think like that. So he found one category who thought, this is the thing with the life, so I don't care, you know, about anything, I'll just enjoy my life. I will not, not talk about what is good, what is bad, I'll simply copy or moj karobal, I'll just eat, drink, and make, make merry, things like that. He found one group like that. He found another group who found this life is no meaning, as I already stated. So they, they are called brave people. <laughs> brave, I don't know, but they said, so no meaning, so I'll just put an end to myself, commit suicide. So there, he found many categories. He did a very thorough experiment. Then he took, looked, then he himself, he always, he said, you know, just, just to eat and marry, and that also for him, not the meaning of human life. He thought it's much bigger than that. He used to feel that everything should be based on reason and find out. But then there are so many infinite areas where he cannot reason out, so there's this problem. Then he watches the majority of the people, how they are living their life. The majority of the people, they don't ask much about the meaning of human life. They don't ask much about what is the meaning of the finite and the infinite, infinite, infinite. They simply toil, do their work on their bread. They work very hard. They are not those group of people who just you know, don't do anything and enjoy, so-called enjoying the life. And he actually hated these people. Then with the majority of the people, he, he found that they have somehow, they are not educated. They do their work, they work very hard, they perspire on their bread and live with their family member and sing songs, enjoy. Doesn't mean they have no problem, they have a lot of problem, but still they face it, they accept the challenge. And they see the meaning in their life because they have faith, not only in this finite world, but in finite. They, know, they don't know. They don't talk about God. But they, they know there's something bigger than me and you. So with this belief, you know, they, they, they have a meaning. Right now they have a meaning. I'm doing this for my beloved family, for my mother, for my father, things like that's enough. That's not, that's enough. So then he decided to more or less join that majority of the group. That yes, faith is very important. You can use your reason also, but, but whether your reason is right or not depends upon your question. And he found that many times we are asking the wrong question and then trying to get the right answer through reasoning. <laughs> Things like that. So I, 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 I am not able to say everything correctly, you know, his experience, but he said something like this. So the meaning of human life, as I said, is that's not something that you're going to get after 10 years or 20 years. Meaning of life is happiness right now. So there's no hurry. Death will definitely come. There's no hurry to die. <laughs> and this, this life is very, very precious, very important, you know. There's so many things, so many beautiful things to enjoy, to live, to be happy about. I, I told you this story about the person who lived 1,000 years, right? Yeah, so recall that story also. Okay, yeah. Hi, Geshla. Yeah. Um, I have to read it. It's not an easy question for me. Mm. Um, I have a friend, a Swedish citizen, who has been held as a political hostage by the government of Iran for over two and a half years now. He's in isolation and prison in Tehran, and they threaten him with death penalty. Sometimes, uh, sometimes his family and friends are allowed to write him small letters to him. 
my question is from a Buddhist point of view. Which message would you send him to give hope and not lose faith? Uh, I, I would really recommend sending him this book. I uh, forgot the name. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll bring the book tomorrow. Thank you. Written by a person who suffered much in the concentration camp. His, his Huh? Men's Search for Meaning, yes. Men's Search for Meaning. This is just amazing book. Give him that book. Because he, in the concentration camp, he suffered so much, you know, untold suffering. But the one thing that made him live and survive was his love for his family. Right? I told you the story of some Tibetan prisons also. So read that book. He has actually written three, four books. They're really amazing. Right now we are translating it into Tibetan. <laughs> yeah. Geshe-la. Yeah. Um, Hello. Yeah. Um, I'm not too familiar with the Buddhist text, so this may have an answer. But um, from a Buddhist perspective, what is believed to happen when the collective population are all truthfully connected um, and embodying Buddha? Is there a higher level of ascension believed to be discovered or experienced at such a large scale? God, what was? <laughs> is Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> is a higher level of experience possible if all sentient beings are finally relieved of suffering? Do we ascend to some other level? Is there a place or yeah. some kind of concept? Yeah, yeah so yeah, all yeah. embodying and yeah, yeah, um, of course. connected. Of course. To and, what is that? and what is that? <laughs> That's why we use the word heaven, <laughs> heaven, nirvan, you know? When, when you are all spiritually elevated, then, you know, there will be no fight, no killing, no bullying, no exploitation, you know, something like that, yeah. So, so, so that, that uh, reaching that level is by transforming and changing one's mind, not just moving to some other place, right? So when you create that really positive vibration through realization, through understanding, then, you know, not necessary that you have reached one of the Buddhist spiritual grounds like that. If, the, if you have reached that, for example, if the, later on, if you have time, there is this talk about ten spiritual grounds, five spiritual paths, Buddhist paths, and ten spiritual grounds. Then it's explained in, in detail what will be the special qualification of that first part, the second part, the third part, the fourth part, and fifth part. And then, especially after you have reached the third part, the path of seeing, darshan mark, path of seeing, then start the ten spiritual grounds, first ground, second ground, third ground. And then, it is written very clearly what kind of knowledges, qualifications, you know, you get when you reach on the first ground, second level. So how those people who are on the first spiritual ground, how they live to, 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 together, those who are on the second ground, how they behave, what is their qualification? Everything is written there. Is, it's amazing, really. Is that written from a perspective of like human 3D yeah, yeah, realm? Yeah, or yeah. yeah. Human, yeah, yeah human beings, you. when they reach such a state, yeah. Thank you. If you, it is found in the, I don't know whether the English version should be there. It is found in the uh, Ornament of Realization by Maitreya, a very famous teacher, okay? And also found in the end of uh, Nagarjuna's Ratanavali also. Ratanavali, Precious Gallant. There is a text called Precious Gallant, Ratanavali by Nagarjuna. And there's this text called Ornament of Realization. Uh, Abhisamaya Alamkar. In Hindi it is called Abhisamaya Alamkar. Uh, written by Maitreya. 
So those those are written there. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. One, two, one, two. Okay. <laughs> Could you share, please, any practice to experience and feel emptiness? To feel emptiness. <laughs> The, the way to understand a little bit of that is through analytical meditation. Not so much one-pointed. Analytical meditation. As, I, as the text also said, as I explained, think about how things are interdependent, interconnected. And once you know that things are interconnected, inter interdependent, then you will be able to conclude that there is nothing that has independent existence. So that will give you some kind of, not real experience, some insight about the truth of emptiness. Right? So, so analyze that. Study more. Yeah. Hello. Thank you for your teachings. Yeah. Hello. Acha. Okay. Hello. Um, as we've talked a lot about mothers, I want to find a moment of gratitude, really, to reflect on our universal Mother Earth, who yes. takes so much suffering and so much exploitation. Yes. And still she provides the soil to grow our vegetables. <laughs> Sorry, a bit nervous. Water to drink and, um, and wash in, and trees for our books so we can study. For many, plants are considered uh, sentient beings that have great ancient wisdom and knowledge and uh, can help us heal. So my question really is about our planet and the liberation of our planet as a living, breathing thing. And uh, is samsara a construct of the mind and a consensus reality rather than attached to our planet? Yeah, true, very good question. So in order to <coughs> take care of the Mother Earth, in Buddhism, we call it uh, the residence and the residence. So this Mother Earth, the environment is our residence. We are the residents who live on this Mother Earth within this environment. So this is our home, not only our home, but for us, this is our only home. Now, with the science and technology, we are venture, venturing out and trying to discover some other <laughs> planets, things like that. And they are saying, oh, there is water here and there. So what? You are unable to take care of this one. And why, why you are doing this excursion? I'm not so sure about all these things. People who have money, who have technology, Again, I don't know. I have to be honest. I, I'm not saying these are all useless to be. I, I should not say that. But what I'm saying is, first we should learn to live harmoniously on this earth. <coughs> then talk about moving on to another planet and things like that. Because this is our only home. I mean, you, if you imagine, take, sometimes we don't, it's not easy for us to talk about the big picture. So it's always useful to start with small examples. Now look at your own home own room or home or room. Do you keep it dirty? And I read a lot of books. And one of the in one of the book I got this beautiful advice by saying the first thing that you should do is at least you prepare your bed nicely. Don't don't leave your, you know, <laughs> everything <laughs> unprepared, you know. Make everything clean. And in Buddhism, this is a spiritual practice. Because you always feel Buddha can be anywhere, Buddhists can be anywhere. You're not seeing them doesn't mean they are not there. So how can you stay in such a lousy, <laughs> dirty way? So, and then that, clean, that, the, that cleanliness of the room also contributes to purity of your mind. That's, that's not said in vague. Like for example, if you keep everything dirty, bugs will come, as, as simple as that. Viruses will come. Right? So if you make it clean, 
viruses and bugs, visible, not visible, they'll not come. Like in my own room, I know it's not a perfect room, it's an ordinary room. So during the, the rainy season, if you don't clean it properly, then you, do, then you get the scorpions. Day before yesterday, day before yesterday, I think, yeah, I was having an online program with the Tibetan community overseas. So they wanted me to do this uh, interview or talk on uh, Telegram, about which I have no idea. So I requested one of our staffs to come, and he helped me. And at one point he said, Geshila, here is a scorpion. <laughs> said, yes, I didn't clean my room, that area, you know. So, so, so what I'm saying is it's really important to keep surrounding clean. Not only your room, but the, the area where you live. In places like Dharamsala, this is a place where His Holiness the Dalai Lama lives. Right? So we have people who on and off clean the area, things like that, but then we have so many visitors, tourists, it's not easy to manage, but then in Dharamsala locally, among local Indians, we also have garbage warriors. We are working t together with them and uh, hope to create more environmental consciousness and things like that. So much of the sickness, illness that we get, including COVID, 19, right? These are all because of pollution of the environment and so forth, right? So we all want to be healthy. And how can you be healthy when the environment in, in, in which you live is not fit for living? Air is polluted, water is polluted. <laughs> So we can't just keep on blaming everybody, but at least play your part. That's the solution. Play your part. In possible, mobilize more people, because the way we are, you know, uh, running the world today is almost like, I'm not trying to give you a pessimistic picture, but it's almost like, you know, moving towards committing a global suicide. The trend by which we go, especially the protection of the environment. If, if, if this goes, the destruction that we are doing with the environment, if this goes unchecked, very soon there will be shortage of water. And that will be much more dangerous than COVID-19. With COVID-19 we had at least came out with vaccination, things like that. If there is no water, is there vaccination? If the air is not fit for using, is there a vaccination? It's very dangerous unless we think much in advance and <laughs> not only talk and have conferences, but we need to practically do things. So we need to create this global consciousness of protecting our only home. And then here, Sometimes, you know, there is, I think there is a big gap between technology and science. Scientists really have a lot of knowledge about the state of our environment and things like that. And those findings, those informations are not effectively shared among public. They should be shared. What we share is the technology, the mobile phone, the latest mobile phone, things like that, and by using this technology, you, you, you show people killing each other, things like that. But we don't show, discuss how destructive these ballistic missiles are, these atom bombs are, the risk of environment. This should be shared publicly, widely, so that they are because then they will know, okay, now I can't do this. Because this is, my life itself is in stake. <laughs> so sometimes I think that is not enough. There is no enough information. It is there, but it's not circulated. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. Good news. <laughs> Which means lunch time. <laughs>